hello to everyone who's joining. Hopefully you can hear me okay and see me and you can see the screen. There's Feast of Fun on it. Hopefully you're in the right place. I'm just letting people in from the waiting room now. And we will get started. Good to see you all. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, if I haven't met you before, or you haven't seen me before, my name is Amy and I'd like to welcome you to this Church Urban Fund webinar called Feast of Fun Running Holiday and Activity Clubs. So thank you for coming along this morning. We really hope that this hour or so that we're spending together will be helpful for you and your church. So before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. This session that you'll see is being recorded, but don't worry, your faces won't be visible in that recording. And we'll send it to you afterwards so that you have it to refer back to. And we'll also put it on our website so you can direct people there if they're not able to be here today. And you should also be able to see somewhere on your screen a Q&A button. Um, it might be at the bottom if you're on a laptop or a computer, it might be at the top if you're on a phone. Um, and as we go along, please do post any questions that you're thinking about or any, yeah, anything that you want to know more about in that Q&A area. And we're going to have 10 minutes or so at the end to come and look at those questions and answer them together. If you can't find the Q&A button, don't worry. Um, you could also use the chat function. I just don't want to fill it up with questions and miss any. So if you can find the Q&A, that would be really helpful. Okay, so. We have got just an hour this morning, so obviously we can't cover everything to do with running food and activity programmes in one hour. So this is going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour um, of how they work and what to consider if you are looking to run one in your community. So we really want this to just inspire you a bit um, and equip you with some further resources if you decide this is something that will be impactful and doable for you today. So this is what we're going to cover. Um, why provide a piece of fun, what's happening at the moment, getting started, funding, volunteers, evaluation, resources, and then as I said, we'll answer your questions that you have at the end. And I'm using this term, Feast of Fun, which was coined by, I believe, Together Middlesbrough and Cleveland, which is one of our Together Network member organisations, which I think is a brilliant work, a brilliant name for this work, as it's exactly what we want to be providing, isn't it? Like a little bit of fun, um, but a lavish feast of it, um, and also a little feast of food. Um, but other organisations, as I'm sure you know, have different names for this work. Um, like the Simple Holiday Club or even like Wendy's Filling the Gap um, as different names for this kind of project. So why provide a feast of fun? So I put this stat up here, um, which Feeding Britain found that three million children are at risk of hunger during the school holidays, which is obviously just an astounding statistic um, that one of the richest countries in the world any child should go hungry in the school holidays, um, let alone three million of them. Holidays are meant to be fun, a time to play and explore and make memories with friends and family. But for so many of our children, poverty turns those weeks into a series of cruel choices. Do we eat or do we heat the house? Do we go to the fun fair? Do I eat some? Do I not eat so that my child can? So since that report came out that this stat came from, footballer Marcus Rashford fought alongside charities and successfully convinced the government to offer meal vouchers over the summer holidays to 1.3 million children in England. But the government has also rejected Rashford's calls to extend the food holiday scheme. So you'll find that many councils across England have decided to create their own meal schemes during the school holidays, which is financed by government in some way by this household support fund, but it's not everywhere. Um, and where it is happening, it's obviously not reaching or covering everyone. And they're gonna have to be working in partnership, those councils with others to make it happen and happen well. So over on the other side of the slide, I've put some of the things that, um, of how Feast of Fun tackles things and what, what it achieves basically. So we know that hunger and financial insecurity affect education. Um, especially spelling. Um, children in poorer areas see their spelling skills decline or stagnate over the summer holidays. It takes them weeks to make up the learning loss the following term. 
Um, we know that it affects school uniforms, equipment and trips. We know that it affects the opportunity to share holiday experiences with peers. Um, we know that um, it affects social support systems for parents and carers. And we know it affects the ability of parents to spend fun quality time with their children. So Feast of Fun tackles so many of these and other interconnected issues. So Feast of Fun reduce hunger, obviously. They reduce pressure on family budgets. They provide fun activities for children who might otherwise miss out. It provides enrichment activities to alleviate stagnation in that educational performance and provide valuable social interaction for children and parents who might otherwise be lonely or isolated during school holidays. And it even provides opportunities for volunteering. Um, <clears throat> they also encourage children to be more physically active sometimes and learn about healthy eating. Um, you could go on and on. So what's happening? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, these food and holiday programmes have been started and are being coordinated um, by several different organisations in our Together Network. Now, if you're in one of these areas listed on this slide here, you might want to contact them to see how you can get involved in what they're already doing in their brilliant work. Um, you can go to their websites, Google them, um, or just email me um, with that email address at the bottom of the page and I can link you up with the right person. And you can see here on the right, um, I just screen grabbed some of the um, some of the Twitter or X as it is now um, posts that are going out about it. So getting started. Oh, I'm going to hand over now to Wendy. Um, who is going to take us through this. Will you say um, where you're from, Wendy, and what your role has been um, in filling the gap before you lead us through this bit? Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, I will. Thanks very much, Amy. Yeah, so I'm Wendy Robertson. I'm from an organisation called Transforming Lives Together. <laughs> We've been told to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I've only just started. <laughs> um, and yeah, we work up in the Diocese of Chester, so the area that I don't know where all you're from, but the area that we cover is ranges from the Wirral up to Runcorn, across the Greater Manchester and down to Crewe. So it's quite a large area. Do get in touch with me if you want to know any more after this webinar, um, either through Amy or, or go to our website, Transforming Lives Together. And we're also part of the Church Urban Fund Together Network, of, of which there are many partners. So um, I think some of them might be here as well. Uh, yeah, so we started filling the gap quite a long time ago. That's what we call it. And um, Amy thought it might be useful for me to run through a few things about what you might need to consider before you get started. I would direct you to our website because we've got a resource pack on there and you can get a lot more information from that. So I'm just going to summarise really some of the things that you might want to consider. Um, firstly, who do you want to deliver it to? So obviously children. But you might think about inviting their carers or families along as well. There's two outcomes, really, for that, two advantages. The first one is there's not so many safeguarding concerns because the parents or the carers are responsible for their own children. And that does cut out a lot of work. If you're responsible for, for escorting children to the toilet, you're getting into the realms of... Um, police clearance and all that sort of thing. So, And the other thing is what we found, a lot of single parents especially get chatting to other single parents and make friends and then they start organizing things to do outside of the provision so it's an opportunity for families to build relationships as well as to give the parents quality time with their children to make things or play games with the with other families as well so I would suggest that that's a good way to go rather than just having the children although it does mean that you're feeding the families as well so you do have to think about the resources and how many, how much you've got in terms of money and volunteers to do that. Um, the other thing that links to that really is what facilities have you got? What's Have you got a hall? Have you got an outside area? Have you got a kitchen? And you might be thinking, well, we've got a kettle and not much else. But you, you can operate with not very much. You just need to downsize what you're doing. So you, we've got churches that operate in old old church buildings that have still got pews but they've got a gap at the end where they can do a little bit and they can manage soup and sandwiches or you, you could consider partnering up with another church in your area and doing it together or or um, we've got a church that partners with a library 
So the church makes the lunch and provides volunteers and the library provides a space for activities. So, and it's always great to work in partnership. You, you can both bring different things to the party and, and different resources. So you don't necessarily have to do all this on your own. It could be that there's something else already going on in your community and you could just link in with that and support that as a, as a church or as a whatever organization that you're from. Um, the next thing is when are you going to do it? And as Amy said, there is some government funding called HAF funding. I think it's Holiday Activity Fund, which is available. You can apply to, but it's quite stringent. I'm not sure if it's the same now, but it used to ask that you provided four days a week for every week of the holidays, which is a lot. So we know some churches that have grouped together in in groups of three or four to put, to do a day each, and that's more manageable. But it is a lot, a lot for people to to provide. So, um, but there's there's lots of smaller funds as well um, around. You, I would suggest you start small. Really, we've got some churches that just started doing one day or a half a day in a half term, and saw how it went. And if that went okay, then they did maybe another day in Easter and then a couple of days over the summer holidays. So there's no pressure to, if you're not going for half funding, there's no pressure to provide lots of days over lots of holidays. You can just do a couple of holidays a year um, or, uh, you know, you might just decide you only want to do the summer holidays. So have a think. This is something that you need to discuss with your team, really, about, you know, what does everybody want to do? What, what capacity have you got? Who can you work with? Um, and people might, might, you might be restrained by what you've got, but you can definitely do something. A lot of churches uh, that we know are very small and, and have gone from small to big. The other thing I would say about that is it can be a bit, um, you can be a bit despondent at first if you put something like this on and you only get three children, but bear with it and stick with it because it can take a year for these things to take off. So we had one church that were, were a bit despondent. They put fantastic amount of food on and it all got put in the freezer in the end. But a year later, they were inundated. So do do stick with it and persevere. Um, in terms of activities, it's, it's the same thing, really. You can do small table crafts. You, you can use your outside space if you've got it to do outside uh, activities. We've got a list of suggestions on our website in our resource pack. Again, it's always helpful to work in partnership. So we've got a couple of local churches that work with people like Chester Zoo, who bring along insects and things for the children to look at. The police are often happy to bring a police car and the fire service will bring a fire engine. So, you know, think outside the box. If you've got parents already connected to your church, they've often got through their work, they've often got ideas and things and skills and experiences that they can bring um, and that all sounds quite big. You know, we've had, we've had churches ha being able to get the funding and to hire an ice cream van and uh, all sorts of things. But we've also got churches that just do little craft activities, show a film and provide lunch. And that's it. You know, don't be sort of put off by by some of these places that have been going for years and are massive now and doing a, a, do a huge provision just start small and talk to your local. If you've got somebody like me in your area who's doing this sort of thing, invite us around to have a chat about how you can get started and go and visit another project as well. If there's another one in your area delivering, ask if you can go along and see how they do it and have a chat to them because they're the ones on the ground. They'll talk you through what's what the pitfalls and, and um, what to avoid and what to learn from. I definitely recommend that you do that. The, the next thing is food. So some churches just do sandwiches and fruit, and that's fine. Others do a hot meal. This obviously depends on who you've got, what facilities you've got, and all that sort of thing. Again, I'd recommend partnership. So there are usually community engagement um, people in the supermarkets. Um, I can't remember what they're called now. Community champions, I think, is what they're normally called at ASDA. And if you can get in touch with those people, they can often organise for you to get leftover food or, you know, they'll donate food or drinks or fresh fruit or something. Um, and that cuts down the cost. There are other organisations that you can 
get involved in I mean there's masses really but but you know they're not you have to look into them really because there are some of them at cost some of them won't get they'll just give you whatever food they've got and you have to make something out of that which isn't always easy so I think having a partnership with a local supermarket is really helpful because you can say what you want and I find them to be really helpful um, it's, it's a good idea, I would say, to have juice, water and fruit around all the time, all day, so that people can pick at it. And it's it's not that expensive. I'm talking a lot about money here, but to be honest, it can be very inexpensive. And I think Maddie's going to talk about funding later. We've actually got a, um, a relationship with an, an organisation called Breaks, who have a funding programme called Meals and More, and uh, they help us fund about seven of our churches. So there are lots of different opportunities out there, um, it, but it doesn't need to cost that much. Uh, the other thing is as well, with, with the carers and families being there, you, you are feeding them as well. So some of them probably won't get a hot meal. I, I imagine, as Amy was saying before, from the uh, Feeding Britain report, a lot of families will feed their children first and they won't get a hot meal. So. It's, it's an, an opportunity really to feed the whole family. Um, so the next thing is publicity and promotion, which is sometimes it's tricky to start with, but once you've got going, word of mouth often is, is the way to go because it'll just, if you're going there, you're getting friendship, you're getting support, you're having a laugh, your children are happy, you're gonna tell your friends about it. So, um, don't worry too much about that but to start with it's always good to connect with your local primary school because this all started um to support families that were on free school meals as, as amy mentioned before but you don't want to um direct the publicity just at them because who wants to be identified as being a family that's in receipt of free school meals you don't so it, all of our filling the gap uh, projects are open to everyone and there's there's really not any mention of free school meals but if you work with the schools they will make sure that the families that they know who are struggling will have access to your project and will know about it because there are a lot of families that don't don't quite qualify for free school meals but they still really struggle so they if you just directed it at those families that um that are uh, officially recognised as being in in need of free school meals, you'll miss all the ones that just fall under that that uh, that line. So um yeah, I think it's it's great if you can have a partnership with the local primary schools. They will and often they will provide people and resources as well. And some of the primary schools have offered their playing fields, the summer activities. So do try and build relationships with them. Use your social media if you've got any, put things in, if there's any community newsletters that go around and church newsletters. Um, the the best way, as I, as I said before, is, is word of mouth. Once you've got a few people coming, that'll take off. But these are all just suggestions of how to get things started, really put posters up, get things out into the school, the school newsletters. Um, that some churches have asked to put posters up in libraries and anywhere where there might be families, if there's local supermarkets, anywhere, just put posters up in there. I wouldn't worry about being inundated by families. It doesn't normally happen. Don't come back to me if you do get inundated, but normally you just get, it's the other way around. So don't worry about publicising it everywhere, really. And let all the groups that are attending your church know about it as well, because they, they'll either help or they'll know families that might benefit. Um, so I think that's pretty much everything in a nutshell. Obviously, there's a lot more detail about each of those things on the slide there that you can find more information about on our website. And um, I'll be happy to ask, answer questions at the end. Amazing. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah, this resource pack that Wendy's mentioning, we will send around to you as well um, via email with the recording and the slides afterwards and it's fantastic it has basically everything you could want um to do with running one of these programs and we'll talk about it more i'm sure um 
now we're going to look at funding, which has already come up a little bit, and Maddie is going to talk to us about this. Um, again, Maddie, will you say where you're working and what you've done around this so far? Thank you. Oh, hi, I'm Maddie. I work for Communities Together Durham. Um, we're an associate member of CUF now, but um, we've been associated with them for quite a long time. Um, and I've also, for a little while, worked with Together Middlesbrough in Cleveland, who made quite a big um, thing of the Feast of Fun. And it, it was very much a kind of joint um, working thing across the town. So, yeah, funding. And um, Wendy's touched on a few of these things already, um, particularly the, the HAF funding, the local authority funding. Um, it can be really demanding, um, as Wendy said, but if you can team up with other churches, then sometimes you can actually meet their criteria. You do have to watch out for stuff like um, food hygiene and making sure that your kitchen's up to standard as well, because you've got to have all those qualifications and they can be a little bit um, demanding on the evaluation as well. So it's one to explore, but definitely make sure that you can fulfill their criteria before you waste lots of time on applications. Um, yeah, local councillors can often be really helpful. Um, we have things called area action partnerships in Durham, who um, are much smaller kind of branches of the council in local areas. And they are quite good sometimes at finding you random bits of funding that aren't the official funds. So uh, it depends on how your council's set up, but they can be really helpful. And if you can get some kind of relationship with them, then that can really help with funding. Um, as Communities Together Durham, we actually have a small pot of our own that we distribute. Um, and it might be that if you are part of the, if you're one of the Together Network organisations, you might be able to kind of have a chat with people and, and become a distributor for some funding. Because um, often you've got better contacts with people than they have directly. Um, so, yeah, the local diocese can be useful and um, a lot of them have mission grants available and um, we have micro mission grants I think that are about 500 pounds so that can go quite a long way to doing a couple of days in a holiday and especially if it's a new thing for a church it's really helpful um, for them to have a little bit of the startup kick and, it, and people tend to um, like to see new projects starting. Um, a bit of sort of general funding advice and um, whoever you're going to and um, just make sure that you are reading the questions I know that sounds really obvious um, but check do lots of checking around on what the criteria for things are and because people can spend an awful lot of time writing funding applications um, and firstly you might not actually need to raise an awful lot of money because some churches can do it through their own sort of donations and things and um, people will very happily donate food um, and you can ask people to give a little bit towards what they're doing as well quite often. And some, some people are quite strict on making sure that everything is free. Um, but actually, we found that if you ask people to sort of contribute 50p or a pound or something, then they actually value it a bit more. And you are doing something really, really useful. You're doing something very valuable to people. Um, and asking for a contribution to that often actually makes them feel better about accessing it. Um, you could do things together with other organisations. Um, it's possible, I, I know of some organisations around here that have got together and they've used um, a professional funder to sort of get some money in for a few of them together. Um, again, partnership work is really useful with that. Um, making partnerships with local businesses and, and um, supermarkets and things, yeah, that's already come up quite a few times, but... Um, an example, I think it was Middlesbrough that teamed up with um, the Bose Museum, who had quite a bit of money to work with people from um, more challenging backgrounds. So they had quite a lot and they wanted to spend it. So they kind of invited loads of church groups along and they paid for transport and it gave them a really good sort of very different experience. So things like that are around um, and travel discounts as well. I think the, um, the rail services funded quite a bit of travel um, and they were happy to sort of give big group discounts and um, so it's worth investigating things like that as well especially if you can get together with other churches in the area and sort of come at it as a bit of a team approach um, what else is Sorry, consulting notes <laughs> Oh yeah, that was the, the other thing was that um, people quite often, it's quite nice, especially if you're an established holiday club, 
Um, it's quite hard to get funding if you've been doing something for a long time. Um, a lot of funders, especially trust funds, which are often where people get their funding from, they quite often like to fund things that are new, um, which is really frustrating when you've been doing something and helping people for a long time. Um, but it does happen. Um, so maybe raising some of your own money can be really good and getting the children involved in doing something can always be a fun way to kind of you get people together and you raise some money at the same time so they could do sort of sponsored activities or sales I know that's difficult in some areas where people are struggling anyway but if you kind of share that story I think people sometimes are, are prepared to to chip in and um, it gets gets a bit further and, and people hear about what you're doing and, and you get more donations in that way um, I think that was all I particularly had to say about funding, but please shout any questions or if you feel like there's anything I've missed, then please do let me know. Amazing. Thank you, Maddie. That's so helpful. Um, yeah, if you have any questions um, around funding that have come out of that, as Maddie's been talking, do pop them in the Q&A and we'll get to them at the end. Um, I've just been reminded of um, if you are new to this kind of funding for project work as a church, um, we have a sister charity near neighbours that you might know, and they have a brilliant um, grant writing resource, um, which I will also include in that email afterwards. Um, that might be useful to you. OK, moving on. So volunteers, another huge topic to consider um, around this. So obviously, if your church is already running other projects in the community, um, you might well be very skilled at working with volunteers already. Um, if you're not, or perhaps you feel that your work with volunteers is like they're not being supported as best they could be, um, Cuff has this free resource, um, Working Well with Volunteers, and that might be good to have a look at. Um, this resource has been recently updated with all of the new guidance, um, and it's a comprehensive collection of resources really to assist you in working well with volunteers. Um, it covers things like managing formalities, clarifying tasks, tackling difficulties when they arise, risk assessments, and encouraging development in volunteers. So there's an extensive guide. Um, it's a PDF, I think, alongside a template document that you can um, repurpose for your own project. Again, I'll send the link around afterwards. Um, we also ran a webinar, a bit like this one, which talked through some key principles in recruiting, managing, and retaining good volunteers, which you can watch back anytime, and I'll send the link around for that as well. Um, there's just too much to go into in today's session around volunteers, um, but we do have those resources that you are welcome to use. Um, I would just say on volunteers that some churches have said that they can more easily recruit volunteers for this kind of piece of fun work if they put up a list of time slots for them to sign up to and that way they feel they don't have to commit um, to too much or the whole session, the whole day or the whole the whole lunchtime, whatever it may be. Um, it's also worth giving details of what you need doing and when, like being clear about what you need from people. Um, and our experience is that, that volunteers can come from such a wide variety of contexts, um, including uniformed youth organisations, members of the local community, obviously church members and local businesses and parents. So don't try not to limit yourself in where your volunteers might come from. So evaluation. Again, another big thing to consider. Um, so it's obviously always worth taking some time at the end of a project, um, at the end of your holiday provision, as you provide it, to find out what people thought worked particularly well and what they thought the challenges were. This is mainly so that you can build on the experience and make things easier or more effective next time. But it also encourages the staff and volunteers um, and provides great feedback for your church um, your church members um, and any funders or people that you've got grants from. It can really help with your evaluation if you can take photos, um, obviously with permission um, from adults, um, caregivers of children um, throughout what you're doing um, and note down any comments that you're hearing um, children, volunteers or parents, carers make. Um, and some churches also choose to collect feedback at the end of each session with like a really short, simple form or just say, how was it um, as people go out of the door at the end? Um, so, again, there's a lot we could dive into in this, but there's not going to be time today. But we do have 
um, an impact and evaluation toolkit, which is specifically designed for churches and small Christian charities, which you could use as you think about the impact that you want your work to have here. Um, it will help you select the right tools to use for your evaluation um, and help you reflect on and use the information that you gather in fruitful ways. Um, we also did a webinar, another one, um, on evaluating and monitoring small church projects. So I'll send the links around for those as well. If this is an area that, that worries you or you think, oh, I don't, I wouldn't have the first idea how to evaluate what we've done. Um, it can sound complicated, but it really doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to take up too much time and energy. Um, those resources are there to help you with that. Talking of resources, um, this is the pack that Wendy mentioned. So this has been put together by Wendy and her team um, and it's on her website. So the link is there on the page in orange, but I'll send it around as well. Um, and yeah, Wendy's developed this pack that has much more detailed guidance on everything that we've talked about so far today. So. For example, there's a whole guide of types of activities you could consider running, which could just spark your creativity in that area. And then it also contains all of these different templates of forms, which you should be considering if you're going to run something like this. So you don't need to start from scratch or go Googling what, what, what photography, like um, photography permission form do I need, for example. Um, yeah, so we'll send that around to you as well. So we have actually whizzed through this this morning, haven't we? Um, we're about 10, 15 minutes ahead of schedule, which is amazing. Um, it means we've got lots of time for questions. Um, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Um, yes, Wendy. Sorry, just, just a quick one about the evaluation before we go on yeah. to questions. That really simple things that children can get involved in as well. Um, for example... There's, there's one thing that you just you hang up a, a string that's a washing meant to be a washing line with pegs on it and you cut out paper t-shirts and paper shorts and then you ask the children what was pants and tops about the the, the provision so it's it's the kids love it and to be honest the things on the, the pants things are always I didn't like the beans or it's never really it, it's great because often the children can't think of anything negative to say about it but it is um a really good idea to to get the children involved or or coloured um post-it notes that they can they can colour in a huge picture and then stick onto that post-it note saying what they loved about the about the provision. So um it doesn't have to be anything too complicated as Amy said. Yeah, thank you, Wendy. Okay, so questions. Sorry, Sorry I'm just realising I've forgotten to mention something as well in the funding, um, and it's probably helpful for other stuff as well. If you have a local voluntary services um, support organisation, so your local VCS, they'll have loads of lists of local trust funders, and they'll probably have resource to help you to get funding as well. So it's worth making friends with them. Right, thank you. Um, right, so we've only got a couple of questions so far, so feel free to add them or you can shout them out if you'd rather just speak them out. Um, so someone's asked, what are the type of costs that need to be covered and what do they look like? Um, Wendy, do you want to have a go answering that one? Yeah, um, I think the, the main cost is, is the food. And if you want to expand on your activities a bit and get people in, like, I think there's some some organization that does Lego something or another, I'm not quite sure what it's called, but they'll come in and do Lego sessions. So if you want to, you know, provide stuff like that, that's going to cost money, but you can, children are very happy, as you know, to do inexpensive, cheap, free things. Um, you might need some craft materials, but again, you can get those donated from various shops and supermarkets. So, the main cost is the tea, coffee, juice, and uh, food. There's not really any other cost involved, uh, and you can make your food as inexpensive as you as you want, really. So actually, um, cooking a whole batch of meals and putting them in the freezer is cheaper than doing stuff eat daily. But that's as far as I can remember. That that would be the main cost. 
the other big one that we've found is um, occasionally people want to do trips out and because mm. that's something that people might not be able to do as families so cost mm. usually it's the cost of transport because you can just you could do something simple like go to the beach or go for a picnic somewhere but you don't need to get there mm. uh, thank you um and also asked how do you gauge how much food to provide mm. i think that is really difficult to start with obviously once you get into the swing of it you'll know but um the churches who are beginning make stuff that they can freeze so it's not wasted even if it's what is put in someone's home freezer so you can make a i don't know a big batch of um uh bolognese and then you can just make the pasta on the day to suit how many people you've got and any bolognese you don't use then you can just freeze it uh, it is tricky to start with because you've got no idea how many people are going to turn up the first day um, to have enough in that you can whistle something up quickly, um, even if it's tons of soup, which won't get wasted. Start like that, start small, because wait, there's nothing worse than waste. And then as you get an idea of how many are going to come, you'll, it'll be much easier then to plan for the future. Um, yeah, one of the churches that we've worked with um, provided um, pet lunches to take away, actually, which was quite that was quite a good way of doing it because they had a bit of food to take home with them as well and um, they sort of put a bag of wraps and a block of cheese and a few bits and pieces in a bag um, and you ended up without the waste because then people would take it around for friends and things as well which is expensive but very useful to the families great thank you um someone's asked is there anything in the southeast of the country you all seem to be up north um so this, yeah, this is um, the work that's happening within our specific Together Network, um, but it doesn't cover, obviously, everything that's happening through churches or through um, other um, charities, faith groups, anything else that's happening on the ground. Um, that, so there's definitely lots happening in the southeast, for sure. It's just not covered by our network. Um, I don't know if Wendy or Maddie have any advice on like, how they can find out what's happening Locally. It, it might be worth contact having a look at the Feeding Britain website because they've got a good grasp of what's going on um, nationally with HAS. And uh, yeah, start with them be because they'll have things going on in different parts of the country. Right. Cool. Thank um, you. Yeah, also, again, your voluntary development organisation. They'll probably have information on a lot yeah. of what's happening. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, someone's asked, has anyone tried anything for older children? We do a lot with primary children, but I'm looking at a lazy bunch, for a lazy brunch of teens, possibly. Just trying to think about types of activities. We have nail painting box and someone who will run a baking session, but looking for other ideas. Um, yeah, Wendy does have this great list of ideas, which might be worth a look at. Um, but do you two have any ideas off the bat? It is it, it is a bit tricky with older people, older children, or teenagers, whatever. But um, not many of ours do that age group. But a couple who do, they do things like film sessions where they provide popcorn and sweets, and everyone sits and watches a movie together. Or they have um, they they got a second hand table football game which was really popular and stuff like that. Or because you can you can easily provide um, games and things, can't you? But you don't really want to to invite a whole load of teenagers and just have them sitting on separate laptops playing games. Uh, but the best thing is to ask them really what they would like and how and uh, do, do a little bit of a survey with them and see what what they would like to do. And um, yeah, someone's put in the chats about board games. They're really coming back now. It's it's amazing how much they're becoming popular. Yeah, great idea. Thank you. There's some really good board games out there now that they're not they're not boring. <laughs> they're great fun and great for getting people to chat and laugh together. Sure. Um, someone's asked, do you get people to sign up or register beforehand or just see who turns up? Um, I think that varies. So most churches don't because they just sort of keep an eye on how many they might they might count how many are there but it's not necessary really I don't think unless you've got children coming without parents or carers and then you need to keep a list of who's there 
Um, but like some of the churches have got maybe 40, 50 children coming in. So, and they just let them pile in with their relatives and their families. And then um, they don't worry about it too much, but some prefer to have a, an idea of, I think it with half, you might, I'm not sure Maddy might know this. You, you might have to have a register with half, do you Maddy? I don't know. You do. And I think you have to provide postcodes as well for a lot of them because they mm. want to make sure they're in the target areas. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, thanks. Um, someone said Make Lunch is also a good resource. And I can see that Liz has also been directing people to um, links to the network organisations um, who might be in areas that weren't covered in my slide. Thank you, Liz, for that. Um, someone says that they've used a booking system to give an idea of members for catering, but we never turn anyone away. Yeah, that's great. So you will have a little bit of time left. Um, mm -hmm some extra time, um, which I hope is a good thing. Um, and you might want to go and look at some of those resources if you made a note of the URLs and where to find them um, in your extra 15 minutes that you get back this morning. Um, but I will be sending around sometime in the next few days um, the recording, the resource pack, this presentation, links to all of the other resources that we've spoken about, um, yeah, every, anything that's come up today, I'll make sure it's in that email for you so that you have everything to refer back to. Um, but please don't hesitate to get in contact with us. Um, otherwise, um, there's an email address there on the screen now that you can contact us on if you want to be linked up with anyone in the Together Network or if you just have any qu further questions that come up after we finish today um, and you want to have a chat, um, please do. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming um, and a huge thank you to Wendy and Maddie um, for helping deliver this this morning and share your expertise around this. Um, but enjoy the rest of your morning, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>